Welcome to The Motivational Midwife. I'm Lynn Jones, and today we have a podcast with Ellie Durant, who is the founder of the Facebook platform, Secret Community for Midwives in the Making. I hope you enjoy it. Hi Ellie and thanks for agreeing to um, do this little podcast with me. So really what I'd like to do is for you to kind of explain your journey because it's a long time since I worked with you as a newly qualified midwife and you've been on quite a journey since then. (laughs) (laughs) I have. Um, Yeah I guess the one thing I was going to say before we start Lynn is people ask me about you at work because I always say oh do you know Lynn Jones because I work (laughs) at the Raven Um, and and um And I say, oh, Lynn was amazing because when I was newly qualified, being newly qualified is being in the eye of the storm, basically. Um, And you always used to I just remember you running around being really nice to everybody all the time and sorting (laughs) things out and not being tired ever. Like, so I just had this. And then it was you and Janine Kessel who taught me to suture, which I was very worried about at the time. But these days I quite like it as long as the. um, We were very, very um, touched by our mentioned in your article in practicing midwife I printed it off and used it for revalidation actually <laughs> awesome yeah and I can remember somebody commented oh you were fine Ellie there was no problem with you training learning suturing but I remember how hess up I was about that at the time yeah. so, I don't think you're alone though I think a lot of people get very very yeah. happy about, about suturing it feels um, like a big yeah I, I say I, I I love I don't like suturing particularly but I do love supporting junior midwives to to get confident at it because I just think and I think you I think sometimes I forget how old I am and how long I've been doing it and you still think in your head you still think you're not very good at things um Mm. but actually then when I'm teaching or supporting someone else I realize actually I'm a lot better at it than I thought I was (laughs) yeah yeah that's nice well you were always very um good at holding space for us learning that stuff but yeah, um, to summarise, I qualified in 2010 um, in Leicester, and that was really good training. And then I came to work in Peterborough, and it was the old hospital to begin with, um, before we transferred to the new build. And I wanted to work in Peterborough, because I did get a job in Leicester, but I wanted to work in Peterborough, because my mum used to work there as a neonatal nurse. And I thought that was quite a romantic idea, to come and work in the same hospital as my mum had worked. Um, And then we transferred to the new unit and then I came and worked with you and Janine on the birth centre as quite a newly qualified. I think I was probably rotating. That sounds about right. I think so. Yes. Yeah. And then um, so you looked after me very well. And then about, gosh, 12 months, 18, no, it's probably 18 months after that. I went to New Zealand for a while in New Plymouth and I practiced as a midwife there for a couple of years and then I had some problems with night shift that were getting more and more difficult some medical problems so I was already writing for my blog midwifediaries.com and I already had a load of YouTube videos out so I thought well I'll, I'll pursue that and see how things go um, and then published a couple of books started another book for Macmillan that I'm still writing at the moment And then I was going to come back into midwifery. I mean, it's now um, 2021, but I was going to do it in 2019. And I applied through the university that, were you working at Anglia? I was, I missed, I just missed you. And then, um, uh, and then, yes, it was uh, problematic, I think, at the trust in terms of taking return to practice. Uh, And then the, yes. (laughs) Because it was, uh, I guess, the new standards, the new Nursing and Midwifery Council standards were just coming in because I applied 
for return to practice. And then um, I remember the day of the interview, I was called to say, don't come for the interview because we're not going to run the course this year. So then naturally started looking around for some other places. And, and luckily Kingston and London were running the course and said, yes, you'll be able to do it at the trust. That's all fine. And I thought this is going to be a bit of an uphill struggle because it's so far away and I'm in Cambridge and I'll have to go in for lectures. And then COVID happened. So barring two lectures, the whole thing was remote anyway. So um so that actually worked really well. yeah so I've just finished return to practice now and got a job offer at the Rosie which incidentally was where I was born so it feels very full circle um I've kind of worked out my mum could see rabbits out of the window when she was having me and there's now like a building in the way I think but I've kind of worked I've narrowed it down to three different rooms that it could have been so I keep asking <laughs> <to myself. laughs> um yeah so that's so sort of, what in hmm. terms of coming back into practice what have you found the biggest challenge then um well obviously I was a band six it would be equivalent in New Zealand um so going back to student status and knowing that I was really rusty was incredibly daunting um but actually the practice development team at the Rosie are so strong um and I can remember going for an initial, you know, you have to go to all of those training sessions before you start a clinical role. And um, there was a there was a bloke who does some kind of admin for the return to practice nursing group. And he said to me, I don't think I was particularly looking nervous, but he said, you must be quite nervous as a return to practice midwife. And I was like, yeah, yeah, super daunting, especially in the middle of COVID. And he was like, don't worry about it. This is a really good trust. They'll get you through fine. Um, and to be fair, they did. <laughs> so yeah. that was that was quite nice. But yeah, of course, like um, I really like birth. I was very keen to be on the birth centre. I think I asked to be rotated there as soon as possible. And I quite like labour ward, although it's always, um, you know, tricky for all of the all of the reasons Um you know, it's, it's high pressure and fast moving, but I, I do like, I do like the birth relationship. I wish I could do continuity. Um, that would be the best thing really. Um, and I did, I was, uh, very lucky. I looked after a friend of mine in New Zealand briefly under that model. Um, so that was really nice. Um, yeah, but I think just that was the most daunting thing. And what about sort of academic, going back to sort of academic work? Because obviously there is an element yeah. in, with any course of academic writing that you have mm. to do. So what would what tips would you give people thinking about returning to practice or even just generally uh, for academic yeah. writing when you haven't done it for quite some time? Right. Yeah. Um, I Yeah. These days I quite like it. I'm somewhat of a late bloomer. Like I was really interested in academic work when I was a, a student midwife, but I'm not convinced I was terribly great at it. Like my grades were good, but I, it, I just spent an awful lot of time and effort on it. But these days, um, active recall is really important. So I know much more how to look at a subject, break it down into its components, choose the bits I need to remember and put them onto flashcards and then revise using the flat flashcards. And um, so that was really good. I did an absolute ton of work in terms of, I got the prompt books and- um, Excellent books. Yeah, I went through prompt. Um, I asked a load of questions in the community that I run. I run a big Facebook group, um, the secret community for midwives in the making. So I was able to ask a load of questions there. And get clear on a few things. I went through the nice guidelines and I looked at all of the stuff that I thought was going to be really helpful. And then I did a couple of because COVID kicked off, and we all thought it was going to be Armageddon. Um, I signed up to be a healthcare assistant, so I was like, "Well, it's a good idea anyway. I can get used to computer systems and things, and I can help out if it all, you know, if this turns into a terrible situation, which it kind of didn't. It's been bad, but it hasn't been. Um, you know, Cambridge levels have always been quite low and things." But I went and did that and therefore I had access to all of the guidelines from Labour Ward and from from the trust in general. So I was able to go through those guidelines and make a load of um, revision cards, essentially. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I do for academic learning, work out how to scope a subject and retain and use the information actively. And then in terms of essay writing um, and writing assignments, 
I think people underestimate how much those are creative projects and nobody, there is no study book that is going to tell you this because they'll be worried about you going off and writing a story or getting the tone of it wrong. But when you write an essay, you will write a different essay from everybody else in your cohort because there are lots of different angles to take and you look at the information and you choose a different selection of journal articles and you are creating something that has never been made before this piece of writing to fulfill a brief sure but I still think like the process of having a blank document in front of you very similar to like novel writing you still have to create something from nothing so I think you need a, a process to do that and I know what my process for writing is these days um I do a lot of background reading and I make essentially a really big messy mind map but it runs over many many pages and then I can look at that and look at the patterns in it and start to shape it into a essay plan that um, fulfills the brief and I also think I didn't quite know I hadn't internalized what critical analysis was when I was a student midwife the first time around I didn't quite get what I, I knew like oh you have to come up with what m might not be right about a particular study but I could only sort of say that out loud I didn't understand that I was perfectly capable of common sense and googling what a particular <laughs> methodology is and going okay so what are the common sense things I could say about this and which one stands out and how do I drill down into that further and then how do I critique what I've just said about it and pick further holes in that? It was the understanding that all knowledge is contestable and you're always going to have something interesting to say and then narrowing that down into a structure. So as you can tell, I'm actually really into academic work now. I think, I think you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, like I'm well up for, I need to finish this book first, but I'm well up for a master's at some point. Because did you, do I remember this? Did you do a master's? I did do a master's. I hadn't, I trained in the days where it wasn't a degree course for any of my nursing or midwifery qualifications. Mm -hmm. And um, when I did, I undertook the supervision of midwifery course, it was a module on the master's pathway. And I remember um, Carol Yearly at Hertfordshire, who was an amazing teacher, um, saying, having a session on continuing on the pathway, the master's pathway. And I remember putting my hand up and saying, oh, this won't apply to me because I haven't done a degree. Um, mm -hmm. So can I go, <laughs> essentially? <laughs> yeah. And she said, no, because actually, if you complete this module successfully, you will have demonstrated you can study at, at master's level and therefore you will be eligible to carry on on the pathway. And right up until that point, I had spent you know, 20 plus years saying, oh, I'm not doing, I'm not doing a degree. It's not going to make me a better midwife, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah. I really had to think then because the, the supervisor's course was 60 credits. So it was a third of a master's. And right up until that point, I'd never considered actually taking it further and doing it. But my, my logical head said, you'd be stupid not to do this because you're kind of a third of the way there already and your dissertation will be the other one third so really you only have one 60 credit module to do or two 30 credit modules to do mm -hmm. so I did it um and I I had to completely do a 360 and say well actually yes it did make me a better midwife and it did because what it, it did was it served to make me really look at particularly evidence Mm. and be a lot more critical of what's placed in front of us as nurses and midwives and not just take it as read that because someone's done this study and it appears to say x y or z um, that it's necessarily a very good study um, or robust study and mm. so it did make me by default it made me a much better midwife and I will often say to students if because I essentially am a very middle of the road not hugely bright person <laughs> um, but if I can get through a master's you know I'll, they can absolutely get through their degree because I am mm. not one of life's academic wizards I've, I've you know worked with people in the university that can churn out an a-star essay in an afternoon that would take me like six months to do 
Um, and that's really impressive. Like, I okay, so I'm from Cambridge. I grew up in Cambridge. I am is in the air here. Academic ability is the thing that everybody prioritizes. And a lot of my friends, you can't you can't get away from it, are like Cambridge grads who are super clever and super academic. But it is just one area of intelligence. It's almost yeah. a boring thing to point out these days. But very few people then could walk onto, you know, um, labor ward every day in a good mood, making jokes about biscuits, working out who's in each room, bringing forward the skills of each student and being you know, qualified. Like they, these are, I don't know, I think those are incredibly robust skills, very much equal to academic and even transferable, I would have thought. I, I would agree with you because I, and I think, I, I think sometimes um, students get very hung up on always getting you know really good grades and good grades are important and don't, don't get me wrong I'm not poo-pooing them but it's not the be all and end all um you know and never is anybody going to ask them what you know did you get a first or did you get a second nobody cares you know mm. that unless you want to go into research then actually as, as long as you pass your course and you understand what you're doing I mean I would if it came down to the wire I have to say, I would far rather have somebody who was weaker academically, but strong on the, on the shop floor uh, mm. than the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I would, I, it, because I think there are people, I would consider myself to be much uh, better on the shop floor than I am academically, despite the role I have done in my, in my past lives. And I have got best, much better academically, obviously, um, because of the role I've done. And like you, I've started to, you know, a, as I've got older and I've been more involved with it, I've understood the process more and understood mm -hmm. what, what you're being asked to look at or write at or dissect or, uh, and I, I would agree. I think, you know, uh, uh, as a lecturer, I have often written, you need to be more critical about this. And I think then on the receiving end of that, you think, well, what do they actually mean by being more mm -hmm. critical about this? And I think you're right, as, as students, there's not many students that really truly understand that whole criticality, um, certainly from a BSE. Mm -hmm. Once you get to master's, I think people do understand it a little bit better. Yeah, because I mean, OK, so what I wanted to ask you, I have questions for you as well. When you have um, a student, so you've got students in particular, the time where they transition from being senior students to newly qualified, I find that time really, really interesting. So two questions. Can you tell a student is going to be a good midwife from early on in their student career? So I we'll do that question first. <laughs> I, I, I think so. I, you know, I, and I hope, I hope those that I've felt are struggling that I certainly if I've been working clinically with them, I, I mean, I was when I've worked with students, even as a bank midwife, when I was lecturing, I've always uh, put my shifts out to students to say, look, I'm doing a bank shift. Does anybody want to come and work with me? And I've always mm -hmm. seen my role very much as a confidence builder, as opposed to a let's pick every bit of information you have in your head out. I mean, I do ask them questions and things, but that I don't see that as my primary role when they're just working the old shifts with me. I see mm -hmm. it more as uh, utilising that to actually build their confidence in themselves and their abilities, because those that are struggling more, I'd like to think that, you know, I can find a way of helping them develop the bits, the gaps, the bits that are missing, either in their confidence or in their knowledge. Um, mm. I, I do feel for our current students across the country, you know, with COVID, because it's, it's impacted enormously I mean I, I'm an external examiner for Teesside and it's interesting because I've seen uh, obviously work from there and work from um, ARU as well and, and other universities and, and it seems to be the same across the whole country you know students have been hugely impacted by Covid mm -hmm. and I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is their lack of confidence. Sure. Yeah, um, of it's not so much their knowledge uh, because they've been front loaded with lots of things, but it's mm. that ability to then put that knowledge into practice and consolidate it. And mm -hmm. that's I think that's been a challenge for students. And I, yeah, I think 
I think we could be better at supporting students across yeah, the well, board. Research says as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Like that's, that's really clear. So um, what are the things that would tell you a student's going to do well? So you're working on shift as a bank midwife and you're being a lecturer and there's somebody you're working with and your um, Lynn antenna has gone up to be like, oh, this is a this is an interesting student. What what are the things that you look for? I think for me, I like to see um, I like to see how they interact with people. Mm. Um, you know, first and foremost, I want them to be caring and compassionate to that family that they're looking after, however that family's made up. Um, I don't like seeing students very early on slipping into the this is how we've always done it pattern. You know, I've yeah. always taught from a premise of we teach you the gold standard you won't always see the gold standard but you should be striving to achieve it every shift you do I don't achieve it every shift I do and that's for a variety of reasons because yeah. you know life gets in the way there's sometimes not many staff on you're stretched very so but it doesn't stop me trying to achieve it every shift I'm on um, yeah. and I, I get very disheartened when I see particularly very early on in in students careers where they are mimicking behaviors that I find less palatable in the NHS sure, um, sure. so I, I like them to be I like um I worry a little bit it's, it's kind of a fine line because I worry a little bit about students who are overconfident quite early in their career um yeah because often I think that hides that they, they come across as being a little bit cocky sometimes and that can backfire on them. Um, yeah. I think sometimes it's better to take a wee bit of a, <laughs> a step back because um, well, whilst I like initiative, um, certainly in third years and senior students, uh, when I work with senior students, I usually will get them to take the lead and say to them, right, I'm now your student. So yeah. you take the lead in the care and you tell me what you want me to do. Um, yeah. Because that tells me actually, that, that tells me what their thought processes are. It tells me what their care planning abilities are. It tells me that, you know, they, they know what it is we need to do for that particular woman. Um, I don't need to ask them questions then because I can see from what they're asking me to do mm -hmm. and what they're feeding back to me on what they're doing that actually they've nailed this. I mean, I've, I've been working mm. recently with a, a third year who's about to qualify. Um, and she wrote me a lovely card because she really was quite underconfident, I think, when we started our block together. Um, and by the end of it, you know, she's nailed it, totally nailed it. And we worked in triage. And I said to her, you know, I would not have done triage without her because she mm. was on the ball totally she was way ahead of me <laughs> in everything in the record yeah. in the care she was like she just had got it all nailed totally um mm. and it was a very busy day and it didn't throw her and she was totally on it um and for me that's a joy then to be able to see that student grow in confidence and she will make an awesome midwife I know she will um mm. I think uh, I like, as I say, the bit that worries me most is that that they get swallowed up by the system sometimes, and I I you know, I can look remember thinking with first years you see a lot of first years and they're all full of passion and drive and they want to change the world, which is great, and I love that, and then by the time they're qualified six months, there's probably only about a quarter of them that still have that passion and drive the rest of they still love it they still love their job they're still very good at their job but that sort of passion and drive for women-centered care has kind of slipped by the wayside and they've stopped mm -hmm. fighting so much I mean I spent my whole career fighting the NHS <laughs> as a nurse <laughs> and a midwife yeah yeah it is exhausting isn't it I, th I think it, it thinking... is it's very exhausting yeah. but I also think that you can do it in a way that doesn't cheese people off yeah um and I think if you have a more softly softly approach 
which has kind of been my my approach through my whole career you do manage to affect change without mm. really ruffling too many people's feathers you can get people round onto your side without because <laughs> <laughs> Sean Walker who we were just talking about um before we started recording he does all of the physiological breach stuff I remember watching a video or it might she might have been in person actually it might have been a um, a conference and she, she said make sure you have compassionate understanding for your obstetric colleagues and I was like yeah that exactly yeah uh, totally totally because I think if you can if you can argue your your case compassionately you're more like, I mean, I, ha, I have had uh, wonderful obstetric colleagues that I have worked with over the years. And I've had um, a consultant who very happily supported me, um, supporting a woman having a water birth who was a gestational diabetic induction of labour. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, you know, who wanted that first time round, but never got it. And I said, well, let's do it this time then. You know, we, we've got telemetry, the waterproof telemetry, so we could monitor her, we could do it. And I was able to go to the consultant and say, you know, I can still do A, B, C, D. We can still check blood glucoses, all of those things. She's happy to get out if there's an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, that's fine, then go for it. So I think, you know, if you, you don't have to be belligerent and, and bloody minded to actually affect change. <laughs> and I yeah. think... Uh, I think sometimes, sometimes perhaps this, that's what students see is people really just being quite headstrong and bloody minded. <laughs> Not yeah. sure it's always the best way. It's a difficult, um, it's a difficult line, isn't it? And I think um, you have to be so many things. You like people. Mid midwives are so many different things not only are you the clinical expert and you're hopefully doodling as well and you're hopefully advocating for the client you're also kind of being a psychotherapist for whatever is happening with the birth and the, the support person and the obstetrician and maybe a student that you're working with um like there are a lot of different and like general housekeeping and yeah um, yeah and you know, remembering and then, that you know the the raft of computer documentation or paper I mean give me a bit of paper and a pen any day I love a bit of paper and a pen <laughs> it's much quicker yeah. <laughs> but uh you know flipping wizards on various computer programs I think whilst I, I love a bit of technology sometimes they're more problematic and and I worry that's another thing that worries me a lot uh, for students is mm. um since the advent of, of our more computerized documentation, it takes the focus away from the woman. Yeah. And your focus is on a computer screen while you're typing merrily into it. And I think, you know, trying to teach them the skill of, of typing and, <laughs> and talking and still showing that you are actively aware of what's going on with her. Yeah is yeah. something that's quite difficult to teach <laughs> yeah yeah it's really it's really hard I don't I don't have answers <clears throat> I like there are loads of questions I get asked and there's a writer I really like that does a podcast um called Glenn and Melton and she was like people are asking me lots of questions and I don't have answers but I do have things to say and I think that's <laughs> probably where we are with midwifery because I think this, you're right mm. If there were easy answers to any of this it would have been solved a long time ago so all we can do is look at it from lots of different points of view and come to a common sense solution that may change further down the line and that's what you do with academic work as well these are problems that it wouldn't be academic work if there were easy solutions to it so you have to look at it from many different points of view don't reinvent the wheel somebody else will have done already some of the thinking for you and that's known as a theory or a concept or a model and you can nick some of that and then you come up with a solution and you present your solution and then you tell people why your solution is wrong <laughs> and that's that's pretty much academic stuff and it's true for I guess that's the crossover for me um like academic and um activism in midwifery is is very very similar um I think really uh, I sure, I'm sure. Do you know Melissa Newman? Do you follow Melissa I've Newman? I've heard. Yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. have enough hours in the day at the moment to follow everybody <laughs> I'd like to follow. Yeah, absolutely. But um, 
yeah I think I think she might be somebody to talk to you Lynn if you're continuing your podcast oh. <laughs> <laughs> um it's probably coming to the end of our time now aren't we I think um, it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you again Ellie you were an awesome band five to work with <laughs> Um, and you never know one day you might come back and join us <laughs> yeah I might come to Peterborough but thank you for all your support like I don't I don't know if this is true for you but I I like huge self-doubt on every single shift and I think that's healthy Absolutely. to some degree do you think it's healthy to some degree but um you did make a you and Janine really did make a huge difference and um that's again the nice thing because you like I bring a little bit of Lynn advice with me to a lot of places so. oh thank you and if, if it makes you feel any better even after 30 odd years I still have self-doubt every time I go on shift <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and particularly having yeah. returned after retiring um you know that I think I, as I've got older I think I probably have more self-doubt um in that you know am I going to keep up with everything that's all these young folk around me <laughs> interesting there's always reasons to self-doubt but yeah oh anybody- absolutely sabotage ourselves all the time <laughs> yeah um anybody thinking about doing return to practice i think that would be awesome we are low on we're not good at retention we definitely need more midwives um especially i can wholeheartedly recommend returning to practice in cambridge is overwhelmingly positive experience and i wouldn't say that if it wasn't true um so i can yeah there's every reason to do it you can do it part-time you can get academic support um you'll get to do your nipe training at the same time these Indeed. days which is great Indeed, yes, great fun. Although, to be fair, I think a lot of the, uh, well, certainly I know ARU, um, NIP is part of their um, BSc Undergrad. course anyway. So, yeah, so they they all qualify with the NIP, uh, which is fantastic because it does make life a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, we will catch up again, I am sure. But thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no worries. My pleasure. Then. Okay, take care. Take care. And there you go. And I hope you enjoyed that podcast. I hope that uh, it's encouraged some of you who are midwives to think about returning to practice if you haven't done so already. Um, And I look forward to seeing you next time.